Okay, give me one second here. I thought I was already. I love technology. All right. We do need somebody to sing like Cucaracha while we're waiting here. Okay. Okay. Um, good Friday morning. Welcome to the Urban Ecology Center's Backyard Naturalist. Uh, you're here. It's Friday morning at 9 a.m. And almost without exception, uh, if it's Friday morning at 9 a.m., that means we're here. Uh, supporting this wonderful, nerdy, inquisitive community of folks who want to learn about their most intimate spaces, our backyards, our front yards, our kitchens, our basements, our bathrooms, our bedrooms, our pantries, uh, and specifically the natural history uh, of the critters and plants that join us in these spaces. You may not want them to be there. You may want them to be there. You may put them there. You may plant them, or you may call a professional to remove them from there, being your house or your yard. Um, I would imagine that most of you don't want today's featured critter in your homes, although I shouldn't make assumptions. Uh, we do have a native outside, living outside in the world, cockroach in this part of the world in, in Wisconsin, Northern US. Um, and we also have some non-native cockroaches that have found their way into our homes. Because of our climate, cockroaches tend to be less of a problem. Um, than they do in the warmer, more humid places like the tropics and subtropic, subtropics. Um, but they're still here. And because they're here, we're going to talk about them. Um, they have great stories to tell us from a naturalist perspective. This is one of the critters that could have easily taken up two or three parts. Uh, maybe Amanda will pick it up where I left off and, and do a sequel. Um, they are superbly adapted um, and have been for millions of years. It's hard to think of a critter that invokes disdain as much as the cockroach, but we associate them with dirty, unhealthy conditions. And the question is, is this fair? And the answer is it's complicated. Uh, so we will explore this more deeply. Um, so sit back and relax if you can. Sip a warm beverage if you have it, as we present to you episode nine of season five of The Backyard Naturalist, Final Cockroach. And a huge thank you to viewers like you um, with a nod to PBS. Uh, thank you for joining us and thank you for strengthening this community. Whether you're here with us live on Zoom this morning or you're watching this recorded, if you enjoy this program and you can support us further, we would love it if you could join our family of Backyard Naturalist subscribers. A subscription amounts to about $3 a week. And not only does this get you hassle-free access to the weekly virtual program, uh, it also brings you 12 field trips exploring local backyards and local green spaces around Southeast Wisconsin, hopefully introducing you to new places um, or helping you to rediscover new things about the spaces you might already be familiar with. We are having our next subscriber appreciation party in a couple weeks. On November 18th, we'll be exploring a local gem of a green space, the Blue Heron Wildlife Sanctuary up near Sockville uh, along the Milwaukee River. Uh, your Urban Ecology Center has had a long history with this place. It's beautiful, a converted apple orchard uh, with some great ecological integrity. And so we hope you can join us. Also, I'm really excited to announce, uh, thanks again to Larry and Gailey, that for the first time in years, there will be a Friday morning without a Backyard Naturalist episode because on Thanksgiving week, uh, we have secured, uh, with the help of Boswell Books, author Margaret Rankle. Uh, who is a frequent New York Times contributor, best-selling author. Her latest book that just came out like days ago um, uh, is The Comfort of Crows, A Backyard Year. And this is, if, you, if you're familiar with The Backyard Naturalist, this is really us in book form. Um, I started reading it. It's great. We'll have a, a, a special. So, so the reason we're not having the Friday morning is because she was only available that week on a Monday. So we're going to have a, a special Monday evening Backyard Naturalist Thanksgiving week. Super excited. Um, this is also a case where you will have to register separately, even if you are a subscriber, because we're using Boswell's uh, registration system, which is way easier. Um, and uh, I really hope you can join us for this 
extra special edition of Backyard Naturalist. And if you'd like to read the book before the talk, uh, you can get it now at Boswell. Um, and you, you can tell the folks at Boswell that uh, the Urban Ecology Center's Backyard Naturalist sent you there for this book. Um, and then a quick announcement again, the, the UEC's Volunteer Appreciation Party is coming up in two days, uh, a, a chance for, for great company and great food and a chance to appreciate the work if you are a volunteer at the Urban Ecology Center or have done volunteering in this past year, please join us for that. Um, finally, uh, the Urban Ecology Center runs an eco-travel program um, that helps us get in touch with the backyards in other parts of the world and how they're connected to ours. We do have a few spaces left on our trip to the Galapagos Islands, which is a truly magical place. Uh, next April, with an option, optional extension to the highlands of the Andes Mountains, where we can find the Andean condor, um, and also to Mindo, which is super rich diversity of av avifauna birds, hummingbirds. So we'll be going from really hot and dry Galapagos up to really cold uh, tops of the mountaintop. So you're going to experience it all on this trip. There's a few spots left on that. On the domestic side, we're visiting Southern California in late February, early March, a trip hosted by Amanda to visit the part of the country where she grew up. And then the, the final trip of the year will be a wheelchair accessible trip to Costa Rica next August. When I say the year, it's uh, August, September through August, our fiscal year. Um, and we're partnering with Il Viaggio, a local business that specializes in accessible travel in Costa Rica. Um, there aren't a lot of updates from the astronomical world today, so we're just going to move right to our featured critter, the cockroach. Um, I imagine you 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 have decent to strong feelings about cockroaches, whatever that may be, and there maybe there's a range. Uh, so we're here to look at look at cockroaches and find out a little bit more of them. Understanding is important, and we're going to look a little bit, really focusing on their natural history. Um, they do have a really long association with humans and history uh and you know that's there's that's a whole that's a whole nother another uh episode um, but we're going to really look at the natural history of the cockroach so to start out if you are a cockroach if we call you a cockroach in the western world uh that means you are in an order blatodia um and right away this kind of sets the cockroaches apart from other insect orders a lot of the insect orders end in terra, which means wing. So you have diptera or two wings for flies. You have lepidoptera, uh, scaly wings for butterflies. You have um, coleoptera, shield wings for beetles. Um, but cockroaches kind of break this mold. They are in the order Blatodia, um, which doesn't have the most endearing sound for some reason, but uh, who am I to judge? And the name does make sense when you point out what the, the origin of the name, Blata, is Latin for an insect that shuns the light. And since cockroaches are nocturnal and they shun the light, um, if you turn on a light and the cockroach is around, they're going to shun it and hide right away. Um, there are almost 5,000 species of cockroaches that we know of. And of those, only about 30 of them have figured out how to live in human structures. So if you do the math, that's less than 1% of all cockroach species have taken up with humans. And of those 30 species that have taken up with humans, only four of them are what we would consider pests. Um, so those are the, the four that we really seem to care about. We'll meet them later. Uh, so really less than one tenth of 1% of all roach species around the world are the ones that we care about because they're hanging out in our houses and we don't want them there usually. This is a really ancient group. I love this photo. It's a um, it's a modern day Turkestan cockroach visiting, visiting its many, many great, 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 great grandparent fossil cockroach from 125 million years ago. Um, and, and that fossil there is, is even a baby fossil because this, this group originated about 320 million years ago. Uh, which is about 80 million years before the first dinosaurs. So they're a really, really ancient group of insects and a very successful one. Here's a 50 million year old cockroach that is beauty beautifully preserved in amber. And today, roaches are found all over the world from the Arctic 
down to the tropics. They tend to grow much bigger in the tropics and, and smaller in the, in the cold areas, which kind of goes against the mammal uh, pattern. You usually get bigger mammals in the poles and smaller ones in the, in the equator, but insects, because their metabolism is different, you get a, the opposite relationship. And the order Blatodia is complicated, just like fish. Um, it's, it's a polyphyletic group, meaning that the, all of the lineages in this order are not, you know, from the same, it's not like, here's the ancestor going down. Um, it, it, this is an example of, of the breakdown of the Linnaean, Linnaean classification system, um, a little bit. So, uh, the, the insects that we call cockroaches share now the order with termites, uh, for many years, it wasn't sure what termites ter we knew that termites and cockroaches were related the latest evidence shows that the the termite is a type of cockroach so it, it it's its own line of cockroaches that evolved into its very special niche and very also very successful niche um, and then there's some debate about how where the mantises fit in there um, and if you kind of look at the cockroach on the lower right and the mantis on the upper right, you kind of see their their head shapes are very sim similar with that kind of downward uh, teardrop shape. Uh, so you can see you can see the relationship when you look at some of these family photos. Um, but uh, it's 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 kind of looks like some disparate groups that are often lumped together. Um, but then again, all all of these creatures also shun the light, particularly termites. They live completely out of the light. Um, and even mantises try to get away from the light as much as possible. So it's a little bit of a complicated family tree, um, but uh, it, it starts to make sense when you look at it. The origin of the name cockroach, I was hoping it would be some really cool complex name uh, origin story, but um, it's not. It's, it's simply derived from the Spanish term for this type of insect, la cucaracha. And so when the English incorporated it into our language, they pretty much just transformed the Spanish word into two already familiar words, which are cock and roach. And, and that's it. That's, that's really where cockroach comes from, a kind of bastardized English translation of the Spanish word. Um, so that's that. Most of the world's cockroaches are very small, about the size of a human thumbnail. Uh, like this wonderfully named domino cockroach, incredibly cute, little, little ladybug-like cockroach. Most of the cockroaches are kind of small and cute like this, um, but some tropical buggers can get kind of unsettingly huge. So the heaviest cockroach in the world, there's two of them. There's the giant burrowing cockroach of Australia and then the Central American giant cockroach uh, of Central America. And each of these can reach about three inches long without the antenna and weigh over an ounce which may not seem like a lot, but um, a double A battery isn't is is an ounce. So they weigh more than a double A battery, which again, double A batteries don't seem very heavy, but for an insect, that that's a that's a that's pretty hefty. Um the longest cockroach in the world is the giant black cockroach, uh fairly aptly named also, measuring in at just under four inches long. And then this is an image you can bring home with you, the species. Megablata blaberoides. It doesn't even have a common name yet, or at least in the Western world, it doesn't. Um, so maybe you can help name it. But uh, this species of cockroach has a wingspan, depending on the source, anywhere from about nine inches to a foot long from tip to tip of wing. And you may be thinking the next question, which is the answer is yes, cockroaches do have wings. They can fly. Male cockroaches have wings and they can fly. Um, females have more of a vestigial wing. They've, they've lost the ability to fly in some insects it's reversed. Um, but yeah, a foot long wingspan in a cockroach. Um, on the end of the end of the size spectrum is a, a really cool genus with about five species in it known as the Atophila. And they're, they're, they're really tiny. They're three and a half millimeters long. And that whole genus uh, of, of five or so species spends its entire lives inside of leaf cutter ant colonies. So they've evolved, they've co-evolved with the leaf cutter ant colonies in a mutualistic relationship. They eat the fungus that the leaf cutter ants are raising. Um, and they kind of trick, trick the leaf cutter ants into not killing them. Um, and 
and it, it, it's it's evolved again into more of a, a mutualistic relationship between the two. This is, of course, magnified, uh, but one individual cockroach, if you want to kind of picture how small it is, um, if you if you get a, a tip of a standard pencil eraser, uh, you could put this cockroach on that uh, eraser and it could move around. It'd have, it'd have room to move around on top of it. It's about the size of half of a grain of rice. So adorable and tiny. The body plan of a cockroach is pretty standard insect model. Um, they're mostly brown, black, uh, standard head, thorax, abdomen, six legs, compound eyes with those ocelli. Um, so they see the world in a mosaic, uh, just kind of like flies, very artistic. And their flattened body shape allows them to crawl into very tight spaces and crevices. Um, they're chewing insects. So they have the labrum and labium, which are lips. And then they have two mandibles for cutting and grinding their food. Um, and then those two kind of longer segments on the bottom of the head are, are really just to help manipulate the food to kind of hold it and move it around like you would, you know, corn on the cob or an apple while they're chewing. Um, and they eat just a ton of different kinds of food. Um, just about anything you can imagine uh, cockroaches eat it. They will even eat wood, straight up wood, which makes sense since they're related to um, the, their, the termites, their, their termite cousins, and they have that uh, gut bacteria that can eat cellulose. Uh, but one of the most prized appendages on the cockroach, the ones that you know, I'm sure they have insurance policies on is the really long antenna, which the, those front antenna, they're known as the antennal flagella. Um, really, really important to the cockroaches like day to day lives to function. Um, they rely on these primarily as uh, at, to smell, to sense pheromones in the air. And that's there is a lot of communication between cockroaches, um, not just for courtship, but for social living. Um, and when you consider that the smell is their primary method of sensing the surroundings, um, you understand why they're, they're so important. They have eyes, but they don't really rely on their eyes like we do to get around. The antenna is, is really their bread and butter for how they sense the world and, and how they react and how they get around. Um, and because these appendages are so important, they do spend a lot of time grooming them, um, like this one is doing. So each antenna kind of in turn goes through the mouth parts to be cleaned, uh, like a car going through a car wash. If they don't clean them regularly, or they can't, um, then the antennas start to lose their ability to accurately sense the pheromones and the world. And so it makes it harder for the cockroach to become a cockroach. Um, like when you come in from the cold and your glasses are fogged up, it's a little harder to walk around until you clean your glasses. Um, the, I, I don't know what it's like, but I imagine that the world just becomes a little less clear, a little, a little duller and, and a little harder. So they spend a lot of their time uh, cleaning their antennae, grooming themselves. And it's not just the antennae. They actually, they spend a lot of time grooming themselves. We think of cockroaches as dirty animals, um, but they spend a good amount of time grooming them themselves, their legs, their feet. There was a, a, a fun study that compared the feet of a cockroach with the hands of a human body. And um, they found that between the human hand and the and the the cockroach feet, we are much more consistently dirty than than the cockroach. We harbor much more bacteria um, on our bodies, particularly our hands. Our hands grew many more colonies on a petri dish than than the foot of a cockroach. So, again, despite their image as a dirty creature, they're actually much cleaner than we give them credit for. Uh, just like we found out was the case for the possum. Um, and the cat. Uh, so roaches spend a lot of time on their own personal hygiene. Looking from above, we we see the, the kind of recognizable shield-like shape of the cockroach. They have a, a, a waxy, waterproofy, waterproofy, waterproofing exoskeleton um, that also acts as like a sheath, as like a body sheath. In, in some species, particularly the ones that have evolved with humans, that that shield can withstand a lot of pressure. Um, I'm not advocating for stepping on cockroaches, but if you if if that's what you like to do, um, it, it they're they're evolving to become harder to squish, um, and so that's that's kind of got that protective shield. Um, and again, only males have wings. Females have, like I said, those vestigial wing-like appendages that still have functions, but they can't fly. 
It is very rare that a male cockroach will fly. They only do it in very specific circumstances. They much prefer to, to scutter around. Um, but just like beetles, like ladybugs, um, they're very poor flyers once they are airborne. So um, they'll set a course and fly, but once they're airborne, they're not gonna be able to maneuver around so much. Um, so if you do have a fear of cockroaches, it probably doesn't help to know that if one is flying, it's not going to be able to avoid you. It might accidentally run into you, uh, fly into you. Um, but uh, it certainly wouldn't matter. You know, I mean, the chances of this happening are obviously extremely rare. Uh, you probably have a better chance of of winning the lottery or being a Super Bowl MVP than being having a cockroach fly into you. Um, but if it did happen, that'd be a really cool story to tell. The grandkids. Uh, the legs of the cockroach are, you know, kind of spiky, but other than that, pretty ordinary uh, looking. But they actually are one of the one of the many adaptations that make cockroaches so successful. So first, they're fast. Um, their propulsion system uh, sets them out at about three miles an hour which does not seem like a lot. You know, we can walk at three miles an hour. But then when you think of how tiny this is, insect is, three miles an hour is a lot. If it, they can run a distance of 50 times their own body length in one second. Um, and if you translate that to humans, that's a human running at 200 miles an hour. So this is like World War Z zombie fast. Um, uh, they're, they're, and, and partly because they're so fast, it's, I think it's one of the reasons we don't like them. I think we like when we see something, we like it to not be able to just move in a way that we don't want it to. We kind of, that makes us a little uneasy. Um, and, you know, I mean, you, you, you can imagine it would, you think that it could like run at you or, or climb on you if it wanted to, it won't. Um, it does not want to come at you. But any, any of these insects that scurry both really fast and with the kind of a different motion than we're used to like you see a puppy running that's like oh but you know if you see a, a spider in the awkward way that its legs move and if it goes very fast it kind of starts to get like horror movie like um and so the the cockroach has kind of the best of all the worlds to make us creepy so first of all those legs can go back and forth extremely fast 27 times in a second it's just almost like we're starting to getting into hummingbird flapping territory here 27 times in a second each of those legs moves back and forth and then they also have an up and down motion uh similar to the the insect that won't be named that has 100 legs um it has that up and down and back and forth motion which really allows it to scurry fast over uneven surfaces uh and when you combine that up and down very fast left and right with its speed. That's what gives us the creeps. Um, each each leg is mirroring the opposite leg, kind of like a four wheel drive. Um, uh, they are also very good. They have little little kind of grappling hooks at the end of their uh, legs, which allows them not only to move quickly over rough surfaces, but allows them to move a very smooth surfaces. So they are able to climb up your wall, climb onto your ceiling, which then of course puts in your your head, the image of them falling into your mouth while you're sleeping. Don't worry, they're extremely agile uh, climbers and they are not gonna fall into your mouth. Um, uh, but, and another thing that's kind of crazy is that, so the back legs are really for propulsion. They're really moving forward. The front legs are kind of stabilizing and really for braking, so they can also break on a dime. Um, and then the middle legs are kind of like a combination of both acceleration and braking. But if they really get going fast, uh, they actually, they actually, they're, those front legs just kind of come off the ground and they're still moving, which makes them look creepy. But then at some point, like the Jesus Christ lizard that runs on water, uh, you can get a cockroach at full speed just using its back legs like a human. Again, getting into that kind of horror movie era of, of, of creepiness. Um, but it's, it's an adaptation that served them really well for millions of years. Um, and it just, it just makes us creep out. And, um, those kind of accessory spines that are around each, each leg were initially thought to be sensory. Um, 
but now again, it's it's really thought that that's just more of a way to to navigate terrain along with the motion. Um, so you know, cockroach legs are studied by engineers um, to help design better airplanes, better robots, uh, and it's just a a very successful design. And then finally, the last important piece are those the two rear end appendages, which are called cerci, uh, and those are extremely sensitive. Um, particularly to air pressure. And it's one of the reasons that it actually makes it hard, even if you do want to squash or squat uh, a, a caterpillar, uh, cockroach, the, those sensei are just like work in a sense, it work in a, in a split second, like a nanosecond. And if something's coming towards it, it can sense that and immediately get out of your way. Um, they're, they're probably, you know, not as hard to get to it's like flies flies are really sensitive to that through motion um but it, it starts to put them in that level where it's just not it's it's hard harder to to, to squish them if you want to or catch them if you're a predator um so those those cerci are primarily defensive maneuvers um the internal physiology of a cockroach is also pretty standard insect plan in the the abdomen has a a, a tube-like heart that pumps a blood-like substance around the body. It doesn't, oxygen exchange doesn't happen there. Like most insects, It it's uh, there's a series of tubes that are just open to the outside world that um, allow for oxygen exchange. There is a special area where fat is stored if needed. That'll help it if it, you know, food is not around, it can go for quite a while. Um, one of its many survival mechanisms. Um, and they do have a, because, you know, they can eat, like I said, a lot of different kinds of food. And they can do this because they have a, a pretty complex digestive physiology as far as insects go. Um, so they can eat starches, they can eat fruit, they can eat pulp, straight up wood. Um, they can be scavengers. They will even scavenge off of other animals, like a little free spa treatment to eat your dead skin. Um, they can eat like clothing, fibers, like moths. Uh, so very, very complex and it has uh, like birds it has a crop an area where food can be held um, particular food that is difficult to digest and then it can be moved to a, an area that's almost like an internal mouth uh, it's a it's a toothy section called the proventriculus and it's kind of grinds the food inside it's like a second mouth to really kind of pulverize the food into a fine mesh and then from there it can go to a another section of its gut where all the enzymes and microbes can do their work. So they're able to eat just about anything. Um, and, and again, like contributor number 47 to why they're so successful. And then a, a surprising to me behavior is that many cockroach species around the world are social. And again, that probably makes sense when you think of termites, which are you social, which are um, you know, have that caste system. And there are some species of cockroaches that get close to that, but they're not like bees or, or ants or, or termites, but they are surprisingly social. Um, so they, they do like to congregate in large groups. There is a lot of communication that we're just kind of discovering, uh, mainly through pheromones. Uh, and it, it allows you to identify your group from other groups. Um, in some cases, it allows you to identify your personal relatives, your, your, your parents or your, your offspring. Um, it, and, and then there's a kind of like with bees, there is a communication system within a colony that allows for group decisions um, without a leader or a queen bee. Uh, so they, they kind of the best way to, to describe it is making collective decisions, uh, collective decisions on where to roost, uh, when to split, when to split up a group, if it's gotten too big, um, these kind of collective decisions, uh, it's, it's like a collective conscience, um, and they exhibit a high level of social dependence, um, kin recognition, as I mentioned, there's social information transfer, uh, it's strong enough that if, if you do those kind of terrible experiments where you rear a social animal in isolation, um, they, they do start to alter their behavior, they, they become less healthy, they spend less time eating or exploring, um, and they start to lose their ability to function without that social structure, um, similar to behavioral uh, syndromes we see in mammals. Uh, and now the latest research is showing that individual cock cockroaches uh, 
appear to have consistently different personalities and how they go about their day, how they behave, which is great for evolution, allows very quick natural selection adaptation. Um, and, uh, and again, in some very rare cases, you do get a division of labor, but not to the extent that you see uh, in the termites and the bees and the ants. I was also surprised to learn that many species of cockroaches exhibit maternal care in many different forms. Um, single parent mom, single parent dad, uh, biparental care. Um, again, again, for some species, you can recognize your mother based on their form, pheromones. Um, so you can find find mom in a sea of other cockroach uh, mothers, just like you see in in kind of a, in the nesting seabird colonies or seal colonies. Um, mom, moms will carry around, or I should say parents will carry around and defend the egg sacs. Um, if, if, if the eggs are the, just like snakes, the eggs can develop internally or externally. If they develop externally, mom does a pretty good job of keeping them moist with her saliva. Um, there's all different kinds of, of, uh, of strategies for parental care. Um, and they will even attend to hatched larva and, and defend their young for a while. Um, when the newborns of some species hatch, um, mom still will tend to them, like I said, and, and they're obviously really vulnerable in this stage and tiny. They're, they're, a lot of them are born about the size of a fleck of dust at first, and then they rapidly grow. Uh, so if they're young, tiny, and tasty, that means they're also a favorite food of, of, of many other insects. Uh, including hungry centipedes, and uh, we just that can come through and just mow down a a, a, a family pretty quickly. Um, it sounds kind of drastic, uh, and, but as much as that sucks, they kind of can afford it. I mean, it sucks for that individual family, but uh, they are, if anything, they're just they're they can reproduce um, amazingly quickly. So in one year's time one German cockroach can grow her family starting with just herself to a family of 300,000 in one year's time because she's having lots of babies and then those babies can start having babies quickly and you get that exponential generational growth. So from one cockroach to 300,000 in one year. Um, the American cockroach uh, is not quite as fecund. Um, we, the, the ones the American cockroaches grow from one to about 800, which is still fast, but the German cockroach one to 300,000, that's probably why it's maybe the most successful cockroach and, and maybe one of the most successful insects around the world. Uh, all of those other strategies, plus its ability to reproduce uh, so quickly. Um, and before all the baby production, there is another kind of soft and gentle side of the cockroach. Many species have courtship. So according to the, again, for a lot of these creatures, a lot of these creatures, a lot of the information comes from pesticide websites. Um, so from the Orkin website, as told by um, Josh and, and Chuck at, at the Stuff You Should Know podcast, uh, they say when, when mama cockroach is in the mood, she will raise her wings and expose her internal membrane and her expanded genital chambers and will release a very powerful pheromone. Any male that's anywhere nearby will use their high-tech antenna to triangulate and find that female very quickly. He'll do a little wing flap that says he's also ready and then he will offer her a, a nuptial gift, which is in the form of food that he produces. It's very sugary, very sweet, tasty. If she accepts the gift, um, then he, will, he backs in so that they're rear end to rear end and that's where he deposits his sperm. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, roaches live almost everywhere on the earth from, from the Arctic. Uh, they, they have in lab experiments survived temperatures as low as minus 190 degrees Fahrenheit uh, with the help of an internal antifreeze. So they can survive everywhere, except they're not in Antarctica, which, you know, that's the, the familiar thing we hear. They're found in just about everywhere except Antarctica. Um, they can survive in deserts without access to water. Some are aquatic and can dive underwater to look for food. And they either use the tip of their abdomen uh, as kind of a snorkel so they can stay underwater um, or they will like 
some diving beetles carry a bubble of air underwater and, and hold it in that thoracic shield for air, some species can go 45 minutes without air. So um, they can live way up in the forest canopy. They can live just about everywhere. So again, this is the result of that extremely successful body plan. Um, but of all of the 4,500 species of roaches, these are the fabulous four, the ones that we care about, um, the ones that the pest control companies care about because they make them a lot of money. So on the upper left is the German cockroach, which holds the records for most infestations worldwide. That's the, the goat, the, the Michael Jordan of, of roach infestations. On the upper right, you have the American cockroach, which is also called a palmetto bug. So if you're somewhere, um, I think Terry was telling about this. He was he was at a place in the south and he, you know, he said he saw a cockroach in the room and and they're like, oh, no, no, that wasn't a cockroach. It's a palmetto bug. Uh, so it's kind of like a euphemism. That's what they're going to tell you. They don't want to say that they have cockroaches, palmetto bugs. Sounds much more exotic, uh, better for business. And then the lower left, you have the brown banded cockroach and the lower right, the black cockroach. So these are the four that kind of really give cockroaches both a bad name and the reason that we know cockroaches so well. Um, we've been really good at helping them spread worldwide. Um, airplanes, boats, shipping containers, moving boxes, moving vans. Um, and so like many species that we talk about here, we've helped them in many ways while simultaneously we also try so hard to destroy them. And why are they so hard to destroy? And could cockroaches survive a nuclear holocaust? Probably not. Um, for the most part, cockroaches need the the warm, moist places that we provide for them. So a, a nuclear winter might be pretty hard on them. They can survive radiation way better than humans based on, on how their, um, uh, their genes reproduce and their cells reproduce. But within the insect world, cockroaches aren't necessarily that good at um, surviving radiation compared to other animals. Um, so if uh, if you're thinking, you know, which which insect might take over the world if if this were to happen, I'd, I'd probably put my money on the fruit flies uh, or the ants or something. Thankfully, thankfully, we don't have data about surviving the nuclear uh, Armageddon, but we do have a good idea about why roaches are so hard to get rid of. They're nocturnal. They're sneaky. They can wedge themselves through tiny places as, as small as 16th of an inch wide. Um, they're extremely fast, agile. They're good at evasive maneuvers. If you try to kill them, they reproduce quickly um, and abundantly. They can, you know, they can go a month without food, 45 minutes without air. Uh, they can survive on the meagerest of resources. So, you know, if you've got, if if you clean up all your food, but you have uh, postage stamps lying around, they can live off the glue on the postage stamps for a while, that nice starchy uh, form of, of uh, sustenance. Um, they, they also, partly because they're such you know, fast reproducers and there's so much variation, they can adapt very quickly. Uh, so I, I will send you a, a couple links on some, some of the interesting ways that cockroaches have uh, kind of stymied the, the pesticide, the, the orkins of the world, the, the, um, people that want to help you kill your cockroaches, uh, those, the, the pest companies. And uh, it, it's, it's really fascinating that when you get into the weeds of that, like how quickly they can adapt to this particular trap or this particular way of, of uh, getting rid of them. Um, you know, and, the, and it, it really, the point is it's hard to eradicate them. They're, they're survivors. Um, you may have also heard the, the fact that cockroaches can survive if they uh, are unfortunate enough to lose their head in the literal sense. Um, and they, they can, just like the chicken, but for a good deal longer than the chicken. Uh, the, the head itself, so actually each of these two parts can survive for a while without the other or, or remain alive. So the, the head can survive without a body. It'll wave its antenna around um, and... and it can even eat if it were to be fed. Obviously, it can't go and get food, but if you're if you put food on just the head, it will actually eat that food, just the head itself. Um, so very, very zombie-like. Uh, and then the body can survive for quite a while without the head, 
It can move around. It can take evasive actions. Those Circe that in the back that are so good at sensing changes will still uh, can can avoid you trying to to stomp on them, uh, even without its head. And this it, partly because the central nervous system of the cockroach is in its body. It does have what we would consider a brain in its head, but the central nervous system is in the body, so it can still react in in fairly complex ways to external stimuli. Um, Cockroaches can regrow a lot of appendages, but they can't regrow the head. So eventually, both the head and the body will will essentially um, uh, will uh, die not of starvation, but they'll dehydrate of thirst from thirst. Um, but that could be a week week after it loses its head. It could still be kind of functioning as a little robot cockroach. Um, and we know this because cockroaches are one of the most studied insects by humans. Uh, they're they're kind of the lab rat of the insect world as we kind of get into the darker side of the human psyche and the pain that we inflict on other animals, like chopping their heads off. Um, but we've learned a lot about anatomy, physiology, nervous systems. Um, like I mentioned, we engineers study their design to help us. Um, there are some who envision uh, little tiny roaches that are cleaning robots in your house. That, you know, so like your Zumba that has its little base station and kind of comes out, uh, you'd have maybe a hundred of these tiny little roach robots that would go into a, maybe different spots in your walls or your floor. So it'd be out of sight completely. And then you press a button and it's really fun to imagine this. You press a button and then all these little robot roaches come out. Um, but unlike the Zumba that has to stay to the floor, they can climb onto your counters. They can get, you know, food scraps off your table. They can get onto your bed and, and clean I don't know, dead skin cells off your sheets. Uh, uh, so it, it is an interesting way to think of of using little robot roaches by you know studying them and and uh, um, I'm I'm sure others will have aspirations that are different from the house cleaning. You know, they, there are actually some that think that they, these can be better. These can be like the Saint Bernards of rescuing victims um, it, it lost in the woods or uh, you know an avalanche victim. Um, but then there are also those, of course, that want to use them for military applications. We've all seen the movies and, and with AI that just always turns out to be bad, evil for humanity. And I wish these stories could end with the idea that roaches are just this entirely harmless, uh, insect friend. Like some of the insects are entirely harmless to us. Um, they're not going to bite you or, or bring you any kind of diseases like directly into you like mosquitoes or ticks which are much more dangerous um if they're living in your pantry and eating your food or your pet's food they they may leave an offensive odor that you don't want um but when they scurry across surfaces they do leave a pheromone trail so remember they they really navigate their world with pheromones and smells and so this is like the hansel and gretel with the breadcrumbs um and they do leave a little trail and it's within that trail kind of a much cleaner version of the slime trail that slugs leave. Uh, there can be pathogenic microbes in that trail that they've picked up from living around humans. You know, you don't get this as much in the in the wild ones, um, but in the in the roaches that have lived around humans, they they can pick up uh, dangerous microbes to us. Um, it's usually not that bad. It can be bad if it's in a place like a hospital that needs to maintain, um, you know, septic conditions. Uh, it can also be a powerful uh, allergen to humans. So you, if you have cockroaches living in your house, you can be allergic to them. Um, and, and sometimes they'll exacerbate other allergies. They can be linked to asthma. Uh, they can make allergies to like shrimp or, or dust mites worse. Um, and as much as I hate to say it, uh, depending on where you are in the world, between 20 and 50% of homes with no visible signs of cockroaches have do show detectable cockroach allergens, meaning you just don't know that you have cockroaches. Again, especially here in the northern part of the US, it's, it's not as big a deal. Um, and while cockroaches themselves aren't dirty, they will thrive if you leave food out and about. So if you do suspect you have roaches, um, you know the first step is just to be more vigilant um, about sealing up your food, sealing up your pet's food, keeping your counter spaces clean, mopping your floors, not eating in your bed, Henry Vargo. Um, if and and 
you know, if that doesn't work, if sealing up the food isn't enough, uh, you can call in the professionals. They would love it. They'd love your money. Uh, certainly, if you do that, ask about the chemicals that they're using. Um, but maybe before resorting to that, you could try some of the more natural remedies. So some of the chemicals in things like catnip and bay leaves are a natural repellent, uh, Osage orange oil, baking soda, borax, mint, cucumber, garlic have all been suggested as uh, uh, anti roach repellent. Um, of course, the, the wonderful geckos that you get if you travel in the south that we don't get up here are great uh, roach control. Um, so if you use these natural battles, you can kind of, these natural uh, elements, you can kind of turn the tide in the battle between you and the cockroaches. So you can go from a situation where you're the one being repulsed by the cockroaches to a situation where the cockroaches are re repulsed by the conditions in your home. Uh, and because they communicate with their buddies, word might get around in the in the roach culture to stay away from your house because it's got all these wretched bay leaves and, and mint. Um, so stay away from that house. Yeah. Uh, if you want to catch them, trap them, stale beer in a jar is a specifically good for American cockroaches, not so much German cockroaches, which uh, Gailey, I think, proves that Americans like beer more than Germans. Um, and then after you catch them, you can eat them, but you should not eat the ones that you catch in your house. Uh, you should only eat roaches that are either the wild roaches or raised in a lab um, or a roach farm. Uh, Cause yeah, you don't want the, you don't want the things that are in, in, in your household cockroaches, but uh, Thailand and Mexico are known from a culinary sense to have uh, uh, really relied on, on cockroaches. Um, so they'll, Remove the heads and the legs and all those spiky parts. And then the body, you can, there's a lot of different ways you can cook the body. You can saute, you can grill, you can boil, uh, you can eat them dried. And it is said that if you fry them, it makes them crispy on the outside with the soft innards. That's kind of like a cottage cheese on the inside. So it sounds kind of yummy. In Taiwan, their their recipes, that they put them in omelets. Um, my kids' pet bearded dragons at school love to eat roaches that we get from Gary's Pet Jungle in Bayview. And um, so, so that's roaches. I usually like to start out these episodes with kind of my personal accounts uh, and personal relationships with, with cockroaches. I didn't have much, but when I was renting an apartment in Townsville, Australia, there were roaches everywhere. I didn't really mind it that much. I'd never really grown up with roaches, but for you know whatever reason, it didn't bother me. Um, Again, probably because we never saw them, except we did we did enjoy a little party trick. So we figured out that a bunch of the roaches were living in the bottom of the toaster. Um, and we knew this because when we used the toaster and turned it on after about 10 seconds with the intense heat in the toaster, you had about a half dozen, 10 cockroaches just scurrying away. It was kind of cool. It was amazing how quickly they were able to get away and hide. And I didn't even realize where they went. Um, so I, I started to try to focus on on one because they're just so hard to follow. They're so fast. Um, and then uh, so they, they'd find their new hiding spots. I, I didn't think it was disgusting as much as that was kind of funny. And and then, uh, you know, like the cockroaches, we adapted to. So we just made sure that first thing in the morning, someone just did a dry toaster run to get the cockroaches out. Uh, and then it'd be good for the rest of the day because they didn't come back in the daytime. I even found a website called how to get roaches out of your toaster. So the problem wasn't unique to me. Um, and then finally, as a quick experiment this morning, I asked my kids what they think of cockroaches. My daughter said she thinks they're cute. And my son, who does have a decent fear of, of some insects and other household critters, not a fan of spiders, not a fan of centipedes. Um, I was expecting him to, to have a, you know, a reaction like he hated them or he thought they were disgusting. Uh, he did have a, he, he thought for a second, it was very intentional. And, and he said, you know, as long as they don't fall in my face, I don't mind cockroaches. And he said, if I saw one, I would probably just back away. So I will take that as a win for the cockroach and, um, you know, a chance to, to, to tell him about how lucky he would be if a cockroach did fly on him because it's, it'd be such a rare occurrence or fall on him. Um, and this is even like, this is, we were focusing today on, on, on our household cockroaches. So there's, 
there's a whole, you know, 99.9% of the cockroaches aren't those cockroaches and they are performing really important ecological functions in the natural world. Um, you know, their food, they, they eat other things, they uh, burrow in the soil. There's, they're, they're part of that intricate system of, of the, the ecological world. Uh, I still don't want them in my house. I, I'd probably have a slightly different take if I had a cockroach issue, but for now they're, they're literally, they're either out of sight or out of mind or both. Um, they might be in my house. I think I can go on knowing that I either don't have them or I do. And they're just really super polite roommates that stay out of my way. Um, and that's the cockroach. So thank you for joining us this week on Backyard Naturalist. Um, I, we need we need a we need a closing catchphrase. We need a way to like end. We need like a tagline uh, to end these. If anyone has the ideas, let me know. But for now, thanks for joining. We'll hopefully see you next week. I'm going to stop sharing my screen.